Well, to your great disappointment, I'm not talking about the economy or business <laughs> or... Uh, um, as a matter of fact, I first want to say to all the speakers who have gone before me today, uh, I've been so moved uh, and by you taking the risk to share your stories in front of all of us and with so many others, I personally thank you. And my daughter's here with me as well, and it's been a wonderful afternoon. Uh, so the story I'm going to share with you today, um, as I said, has really nothing to do with my job. Uh, Daphne asked, will you please you know, tell a story that could inspire young women? Uh, and I thought I really am probably the wrong person to do that. Um, so I titled my speech, I Survived by Outrunning My Brothers, because uh, I grew up <laughs> with brothers. Uh, so what I'm going to do is tell you a story that, uh, about my life. Uh, and some of this I've never shared publicly, so it's a little bit of a hard story for me as well. So you may have to be a little patient with me as I try this out today. Um, I first want to start with three years ago, I was appointed to this position uh, as the head of the Chamber of Commerce for Denver. Uh, and I was in the paper a great deal. And uh, it, one of the things that it said in the paper is I grew up in Montana uh, and I grew up with brothers. Uh, and a businessman in rural Colorado who also grew up in Montana had never met me, but he read about me. And he said, I know, I know everything you need to know about her. She's one tough chick. Uh, and when he met me a couple months later, he said, I've already told everyone uh, what they need to know about you. And he described it to me. And it struck me that my speech today is probably trying to describe to you why someone could draw such an accurate conclusion uh, on so little information. So here's a bit of my story. Um, my birth father was killed before I was one year old. He was stabbed. My mom bore four children in her life at a very young age. Um, and with a lot of, when she brought us into the world, she had a lot of unmet needs still. Uh, of the four kids, she gave one up for adoption, and she kept my brothers and I. Uh, I was the only of those four children who was conceived in wedlock. She married, ultimately, uh, a man who adopted me and is my father today. He adopted me when I was in third grade. He's the father of my youngest brother. He worked in the oil and gas field, uh, and I credit my extensive four-letter vocabulary to him, not, none of which you will hear today because this is being taped. He was a disciplinarian, and I think a lot of his parenting skills came from his military background. His desire was to raise good people, and he worked very hard as our father to do it. When I was in junior high, he was injured very badly, and he could no longer work. It was a time of significant change for our family, and we faced losing everything that we had. Uh, we went on welfare at that point. Now we call it assistance, I think, to make people feel better about what you're going through. There are two emotions I will share with you about that time to describe it. The first is, I can assure you, there is no emotion in life more damaging than shame, and there is no motivation more powerful than hope, and my family had both. My parents worked a lot during this time in our lives, at any job they could find. My mom babysat between 12, I can't even believe when I say this, between 12 and 15 kids a day. I assure you, if they were licensing daycare, she could never have been licensed. Many of those children stay in touch with her today, to this day as adults. She was a wonderful caregiver. We cleaned businesses at night as a family. We cleaned a bank, we cleaned an electronics store, and we cleaned a big bud factory. My father worked as a nighttime security watchman, and he was going to college full time so he could retrain himself for a new job. So you know what that meant? It meant my brothers and I were pretty independent by necessity. We worked as well, but they had a big influence on me. This story today is to share with you five lessons my brothers taught me. But I must give you a little more context. My brothers are big men. They were very big boys. My older brother in particular understood the value of his size and used it regularly. They taught me a number of lessons. The first lesson they taught me is that as a woman, there was no place I couldn't be, shouldn't be, including physically in a fight with them on almost a daily basis. <laughs> they treated me like they treated each other and their friends. They expected me to, me to be as tough, rough, and fun as they were. Now, that's a great lesson, and as a woman now, I will share with you all the places in my life that that has paid off. 
But the reality, and this goes to lesson two, there was no way I was going to survive if I relied solely upon my physical strength to compete with my brothers as we grew up. To give you a little more context, I was very small. When I went into high school, I wasn't five feet tall and I didn't weigh 100 pounds. I was not going to be able to physically fend for my life with them. So I learned two additional skills. This is not a joke. I learned to run very, very, very fast. The second one I learned that has been very helpful today is my humor. I used it then to de-escalate the situation, to make my brothers laugh, and to connect with them. My crass, inappropriate humor was perfect for teenage boys, and it, I find it still serves me well today with many people. <laughs> the third lesson they taught me was loyalty. Probably in the most unhealthy way a person can learn to be loyal, I was taught to be loyal. We fought inside our house in ways people probably should never fight. But if someone came from outside of our family and threatened any one of us, particularly me as the only girl, my brothers defended me to the end. It really didn't matter what I did or if it was warranted, my brothers defended me. They taught me loyalty to people and causes as I grew up. I'm forever in their debt for that. They also taught me while we would fight one day, they could be my confidant and my closest friend the next and that carrying grudges in this life was never going to serve us well. So even when I lost a battle with somebody, the very next day they could become my partner or my supporter, and I should never forgo the opportunity to ensure that still could happen. And the fifth thing they taught me, you will believe has no value, but they taught me to eat fast, very fast. When we sat at the dinner table, my brothers were like locusts. You protected your plate, and you ate as fast as you could. And many of you can relate to this if you've ever had a teenage boy at a dinner with you. Some of these lessons are clearly more valuable than others. I want to share with you now in my own life where I've seen these lessons show up and how to this day they can make me chuckle and laugh. I have been the first woman to hold three positions in my life. My first job as the first woman to do it was I plowed snow on call at Stapleton International Airport. Yes, it is well worth hearing the story. You won't today. <laughs> I was the first woman to head the Human Resources Department for the city of Denver, and I was the first woman to take over as the, the president and CEO of the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. It never occurred to me at any of those points that the first woman couldn't still do a good job and couldn't do it just as well as my brother showed me I was capable when I was young. I did a lot of union negotiations in my career, one of the strategies in a good union negotiation, particularly in public safety, is there's a couple big burly guys they bring into the room to ensure the intimidation factor is present. I could actually chuckle out loud because these were my brothers. <laughs> That's exactly how I saw them. My humor, again, served me extremely well in those situations and to be able to connect on a very personal level in those negotiations. I wouldn't say they were pleasurable, but I would say they were productive. My loyalty continues to show up in my life, in particular for my employers. There have been three in my life who have had such a huge impact on me, and my loyalty remains. What brought me to Colorado was a job at Excelsior Youth Center. This is a great youth center that does powerful work in Aurora. I continue to stay in touch with them, raise money on their behalf, and provide support for their programs. The second place for me was the city of Denver. This is the place where I really cut my management teeth. It was an organization that I also saw as delivering the exact services my family depended on at one point in our lives. I will love that organization and all 12,000 employees who work there. And the third, of course, is at the Chamber Now, an organization that I feel has given so much not just to me, but back to our community as we try to create jobs and opportunities for every single person in Colorado. But it doesn't end there. I would say the commitment to causes can be downright annoying. And if any of you have had to listen to my lectures on education, um, it's a lot of data and a lot of facts, but a whole lot of passion. And I suppose I still run fast. Most people tell me the issues that I'm working on today are a marathon. I should slow down. It's going to take more time. But I will tell you, as you saw, I dash. And my brothers taught me to dash, and I continue to feel an urgency in the work I do. Yes, and even eating fast has paid off. I do a lot of speeches at lunches, and they rarely give you time to eat. 
Inevitably, the people who have organized it are impressed when they give me five minutes. I can not only eat my entree, I can get my dessert done in three minutes and be on the stage on time. <laughs> I really do thank my brothers for that. My purpose in telling all of this story and sharing it with all of you is not so much that you can be entertained by my background or surprised by it, as many probably are, but it was really to acknowledge one piece of this story and that is for a long time in my life, I didn't want to share it. I didn't want this story. I either didn't want the part where my family needed assistance or help, or if I did have to share that part of it, I wanted to tell you that, that there was something very special, that there were heroes in my life who saved the day, that my parents were superhuman in their ability to navigate what we faced, or my father was a hero when he entered our lives and everything changed for the positive. Or my brothers were particularly loving and nurturing. And while each of the characters in my story has shining, incredibly shining moments of beauty that you too would be very proud of, the reality is there was no hero. And I share this story because I think that's probably much more all of our reality. And the magic in my story is there was no individual who came riding in on a horse and saved our day. And today as adults, as we try so hard to influence the lives of our children, or if we're aunts and uncles, big brothers and sisters, whether in the truest sense or in the sense of mentoring, we are trying to touch the lives of young people every day. And I think we do it by really focusing on how can I create more positive experiences, not a lot of drama, how can I provide the opportunities for learning that don't bring the hardship, and yet that's not how life often delivers. And some of the most powerful moments that created who stands here today came out of hardship and weakness in those around me and in myself. And I think that really is the power in all of us. And to not start to acknowledge publicly that we all have weaknesses and we all have hardship in our life would be unfair because then we're all looking for a hero to save us or to fix whatever challenge or issue we face. So I want to share a final story with you. <clears throat> my father taught my brothers and I to drive on this old 63 Chevy pickup. It didn't have power steering, didn't have power brakes. I was so small, I would actually have to stand up to push on the clutch and <laughs> lean on the shifter. I think my dad did just that, laughed every time I shifted. <laughs> I could barely make the corner. And my dad said to me, honey, if you can drive this, you can drive anything. And as I look at my life story, I realize that is my metaphor, that I can drive anything. And while I think my story has prepared me to do that, I suspect your story has done exactly the same for each of you. I thank you for allowing me to share mine today. <laughs>